It's time for From the Short Grass with Trey Shap, a golf podcast for those who love golf, struggle with golf, and just like to enjoy the outdoors and fellowship with friends, all while chasing a ball around trying to put it in a four and a quarter inch diameter hole. From the Short Grass is brought to you by Stevens Incorporated, an independent financial services firm with the freedom to focus on what matters most. And by Beachwood Pinnacle Hotels. We partner with you to deliver high-yield results by managing, developing, and investing in top-quality hospitality assets. And now, from the short grass, here is your host, Trey Schaaf. And with a score of 275, the winner of the gold medal and the champion golfer of the year is Xander Schofle. Yeah, it's, a, it's an honor. It's, it, I've always dreamt of doing it. The, uh, that walk up 18 truly is the coolest with the yellow leaderboards and the fans and the standing ovation. It, it really is the coolest, one of the coolest feelings I've ever had in my life. I, I got chills walking down and quickly had to zap myself back into focus because the tournament wasn't over yet. So, you know, I'm, I'm just, I can't wait to, to enjoy this with my family. That is the voice of the champion golfer of the year. Xander Schauffele wins the Open Championship by shooting a total nine under par. Justin Rose and Billy Horschel finish tied for second. Xander Schauffele winning the 152nd Open Championship at Royal Troon. He now has the Wanamaker Trophy by winning the PGA Championship back in May and the Claret Jug by winning the Open Championship. It's the first time that the United States has held all four major championship trophies in the same year since 1982. Xander with the PGA Championship and the British Open, Bryson DeChambeau with the U.S. Open Championship trophy, and, of course, Scotty Scheffler winning the Masters back in April. Coming up on this edition of From the Short Grass, I sit down with Joe Carter, the five-time All-Star and two-time World Series champion of the Toronto Blue Jays. He's also a member of the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. He was inducted in 2003. Joe Carter coming up on this edition of From the Short Grass. Beachwood Pinnacle Hotel Group, Matthew Allen and Blair Allen, they know how to manage hotel properties. When you need an overnight place to stay, Make sure you stay at one of their properties. How do you do that? Find them on the web, bphotels.com. We're back with Joe Carter after this. Stay with us. Strength is measured not by the number of accounts. Strength is placing value on relationships. It's having the vision and the guts to invest in growth. It's the commitment to responsibly manage your money. At Stevens, we believe that our strengths build success. Not only for us, but for our clients. Stevens, member NYSE, SIPC. Heading to El Dorado to check out some live music or to play Mystic Creek? Stay at the Haywood, the only boutique hotel in the middle of downtown and the Murphy Arts District. If you are spending a weekend in Hot Springs, make plans now at the Marriott Courtyard close to Lake Hamilton and Oakwan. Beachwood Pinnacle Hotel Group manages both of these fine properties and you will rest easy knowing that your every need is taken care of. Beachwood Pinnacle Hotels on the web at bphotels.com. Welcome back to this edition of From the Short Grass. I am your host, Trey Shap. Joe Carter, man, I had the chance to sit down with him at the Invited Celebrity Classic back in April down at Las Colinas Country Club in Irving, Texas. What a guy. What a fantastic gentleman he is. I think you're really going to enjoy my interview with him. Five-time All-Star, two-time World Series champion. He was drafted by the Chicago Cubs, my team, but never got to play for the Cubs in Wrigley Field, although he did get called up, and you'll hear a little bit about that coming up. On the tee, Joe Carter. Joe, thanks for joining me on From the Short Grass. Man, you look like you could go out there and still play nine innings. Um, I could hit, but I need a designated runner (laughs) (laughs) because I am not going to be doing running. Yeah. uh, No, you know, I'm 64 years old now. And uh, life is good. I have no complaints. And, you know, health-wise, I'm very good. So, 
You know, if you get out and play, you know, golf three or four times a week, walk six and a half, seven miles, it's, it's a pretty good deal. When did you pick up this game of golf? Well, I tell everybody my first, I signed in 81 with the Cubs. And in 82, I got My in, team. <laughs> yeah, and the thing about the Cubs is they trade away all their best players. But uh, I got a, Billy Williams got me a bat contract with Louisville Slugger. And at the time, Louisville Slugger was either paying you $250, great deal, I mean, for a bat contract. That was a great deal, right? Yeah. And uh, Or they gave you a set of power-built golf clubs, the big old orange bag. I mean, oh, yeah. bright orange. Yeah. So I said, you know what? Give me the golf clubs because they're worth more. And uh, so that was 82. So I get the bag. And then, you know, I've always been a pretty good athlete and hitting the ball. And uh, so I just took it up after that. But it wasn't until I got out of the game where I could really improve my game. But I played all during the season, all the time. So it was uh, once you get to the big leagues, I mean, no, it was fun. Where did you play? I mean, obviously, did you play during the season when you're on the road oh, some? Yes. I mean, carry the clubs there. But did, up in Toronto, where did you play? In Toronto, our, tra- our equipment manager, Jeff Ross, was a golfer. So when we would travel, we had 25 bags, <laughs> golf clubs, because Cito Gaston played, all of the coaches played. And so, you know, we didn't go out carousing or drinking and things like that after a game. We'd go back to the hotel, go to bed, get up. We'd have the first tea time. We'd play like at Hazel Team. You play up in Sahali. Uh, you play uh, Black Wolf Run uh, up in, up in Wisconsin, Wisconsin. And we'd have one of the first tea times. You tee off at 7 o'clock. 12 o'clock, you're back in your hotel room. And, you know, you get a bite to eat, take a nap go to the ballpark on the road, you go to the ballpark about 4.30. That was a great day. And for me, I hit five, I hit three home runs in a game five times. Three of those days I played golf that morning. (laughs) Who says that playing golf messes up the baseball swing? I'm a low ball hitter. Yeah. So golf really helped me. I remember uh, we were in Boston and, and Rich Gedman was the catcher. And I just wore out the Red Sox in that Fenway Park and the, the Green Monster. And about the third at bat, <laughs> Getty goes, did you play golf this morning? I go, yep. He said, we ain't throwing you nothing low. We're going to throw you up yeah. high. Cause, up around the letters. Yeah, when, it, <laughs> when it's low, that's, that's the sweet spot. What is it about golf that draws athletes in? Is it the fact that you can play it for an extended period of time, unlike baseball or football in a nutshell golf is a game as an athlete we're very competitive and you're always chasing perfection and it's a perfection you will never achieve because when you do achieve that perfection you got to go out the next day and do it again and it's not going to happen and the pros will tell you that so it's the idea that when you get to the first tee you're always hopeful okay this is going to be my best round and after you shank the first ball or hit it out of bounds, you go, well, you know, then you go on to the next one. But it's a game where you're all, I mean, the ball is sitting there, but it's all about, you know, the perfection, the pursuit of the game and trying to control everything and controlling everything between, you, between your two ears. Yeah. And that's, that's the love of the game. But I tell you what, when you hit those great shots and you practice enough and you go out there, I mean, it is a phenomenal game, and the way I look at it, I've never had a bad day on the golf course ever in 64 years. I tell this joke all the time, and I tell it to a lot of my friends. Uh, a bad day on the golf course beats a good day in the office <laughs> <Yeah>. any day. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, I've seen, I've had some guys I play with, I mean, they're throwing clubs and breaking clubs, and I'm just, I'm laughing. I'm like, Dude, if I mean, if it's that bad, just take two weeks off and then quit. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that one too. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. I've heard that one too. Joe, when when you get on the first tee of, let's say, like a celebrity tournament, and you have fans around you, are you nervous? I'm a red light player, and what that means is when the red light comes on, that's when I shine the best. I like being in front of that and one guy who taught me that as a rookie with the Cubs you know when I signed in 81 they they brought me up to the big leagues for two weeks now I I wasn't on the roster 
Uh, didn't have a big league contract, but they said, we want you to just see what it's like in the big league. So I traveled with the team, and Billy Williams oh, yeah. was the hitting coach. And so I'm sitting on the bench talking to Billy, and he says, hey, I want you to look for that red light. I'll tell you how to get on TV because I want, you want everybody to see you on WGN. And he said, anytime somebody does something good in the field or at the plate, when they come in the dugout, go sit right next to them. I said, your parents will see you every single time on WGN. And so I'm, I'm looking, and Fergie Jenkins is pitching. He strikes up the side and comes in and sits down. I come down to sit right next to him. You know, somebody hits a home run, they come in the bench, they give a high five, and I sit right next to him. It's like, and everybody calls, oh, man, we saw you on TV. We saw you on TV. And so I learned to look for that red light. And so now when I'm on the golf course, you know, I like the fans to be clapping, yelling, and screaming because I'm perfect with that. But I'm looking, and I'm looking. My brother's my caddy, Fred, and I'm looking. I say, ooh, Fred Hayes, it's, uh, it's 1 o'clock. TV comes on at 1 o'clock. I say, we're on TV now. I say, there's the red light. I say, watch this. Let's give them something to, to, yeah. to, to make it happen and show them what we can do. So, no, I, that's, that's me. I like being in that situation. Joe, my summers were my mom taking me and my brother to the golf course, and she would pick us up on her lunch break, and in the afternoon, I'm glued into WGN. That's how I became a huge Cub fan. Okay. Well, everybody back then you had the Cubs and you had the Braves. Yeah, TBS, TBS and, WGN. and WGN. And the games with the Cubs were in the afternoon because yeah. Wrigley didn't have lights when no, I was growing up. They, they did not. So, you know, I never got a chance to play that much in Wrigley because when they traded me away in 84. Uh, but then going back there when I announced in, uh, in 2000, 2001, 2002 with Chip Carey mm -hmm. uh, when Steve Stone had became ill, so they replaced him for two years. And I tell you what, it's a cult following. It, I mean, we'd go on the road and we'd get into a hotel at 4 o'clock in the morning. There's 500 Cub fans. And I'm like, and then we had the, uh, the winter banquet. Uh, Cubs convention Cubs in convention. Chicago, yeah. And, you know, I had been in Cleveland, I've been in San Diego, I've been in Toronto, where you have those winter conventions, and you yeah. may get three or 4,000 people. We go down in the, into the hotel, I'm like, what is going on here? I mean, there's like 10, 15,000 people. Yeah. I'm like, wow, I had never experienced anything like, like that in my life. What was your reaction when they won in 2016 the World Series? I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was some kind of special. You know, your heart bleeds that blue, and you sit there, you go, come on, it's about time, it's about time. And now they can, I know when, when I announced they had the flag out there, uh, in, I think it was in right field where they had all the days between the last. The yes. Last. Yeah. So I said they can finally take that number down and everything. To zero. To zero. And when, when, when Chris Bryant fills the ball, and the thing is, when he threw the ball, he slipped. He did. You know, his feet, I mean, he slipped. And I'm like, no. And so when they were playing, my other team I got traded to was the Indians. Mm -hmm. So I felt the pain with the Indians, but the Cubs, it was about time. And I know everybody in Chicago, those people that were 80, 90 years old, you know, they said, hey, I can, I can leave the earth now because the Cubs have won the world championship. Could you imagine if that – throw from Chris sails a little bit high of Rizzo and he misses it wow. and the game continues or something then you would really think okay they are cursed yeah, they are the, right yeah they, are, yeah they are cursed yeah that is for sure so uh but no you know it it didn't happen you know they they made the play they came back they had their they had the delay and everything and that yeah. turned the tide a little bit so uh you look for those you look for those moments and uh it was it was just their time. You remember where you were when certain events happened. Yes. I know exactly where I was, game seven, when it ended. And I know exactly <laughs> what I did right after it as well. Okay. Now, can you print that on the air? You, yeah, you know, I okay. cried. You I was cried. in my living room watching the game, talking to my wife on the phone. As soon as the last out was made, I was like, I can't believe it. They yeah. did. I mean, tears were coming down my cheeks. And that's, that's what a lot of people feel. I mean, my daughter lives in Chicago right there on, on, on Lakeshore and everything. And so, and, and when, the, when the parade and, and when everything happens, like How they many were, pe five they were, million they were people filling there for the that streets parade? and yeah. everything. And she was like, it's going crazy up here, Dad. So I said, yeah, it's been a long time. 
you know, and I what the eighty-five bears was last mm-hmm. time. Well, we don't count the bulls because that was Michael that was Jordan. Michael. That Jordan. was yeah. I mean, they won all the time. So. Yeah, and the Blackhawks would yeah, win the every Black now Hawks, and then. Yeah, but it was something about the Bears and the Cubs. Yeah, you know, and the Cubs they finally won it. Man, it was yeah, it was good for baseball. When you were playing uh, the game and you had your golf outings and you would play with some of your teammates and stuff, did y'all have side bets going on? What would y'all play for? We, no, we'd, we'd always have side bets, but what we would do, we would play a game. Two of the games we played was wolf yep. and animal golf. What's animal golf? Animal golf is you have, you have four animals. So okay. you have a frog. So that means every time a ball goes in the water, you have the camel, that's the sand. You have the snake, that's a three putt, and you have the gorilla when you hit it out of bounds. And so after nine holes, so if you're on the first tee and you hit the ball in the sand, okay, you're the first one in the sand, it's a dollar. Okay. Another person hits in the sand after you, now it goes to two dollars. And so you go all the way up, it keeps going up to the ninth hole. And so if you have that animal after nine holes, you pay everybody what it's worth. And so every time someone's three putt, it goes up a dollar. So you don't want to have the animal come into the ninth hole, and, and you want to avoid it. And sometimes we've played courses where there's like 10,000 bunkers out there, and, and guys are on the 18th hole, and we're hitting seven irons just like 140 yards because you don't want to go too far, and then you're, you're laying up in front of the sand trap because it costs you 20, 30 bucks per person. Because there's so much sand. So that's yeah. what we call animal golf. Man. And those were two things that we did. It wasn't any high stakes or things like that. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a Michael Jordan thing, you know, where he's betting $10,000 a hole. Nah. Or John Smoltz when he's playing Tiger and they're playing for meal money. Yeah. It, well, yeah. What's Tiger's meal money is. Now, true story here. 1994, I beat Tiger. Yeah. I played, where? I played with him and his dad in Anaheim at his, at his home course. So after the World Series, Tiger was a big baseball fan. So my friend of mine set it up, and we became good friends after that. So I go out and play with, with him and his dad, Earl. And uh, <clears throat> I'm hitting, you know, dog leg left, I'm hitting to the right. Dog leg right, I'm hitting to the left. And Earl goes, you know, this, you, it's a dog leg left. It's a dog leg right. I'm like, well, that's why I'm a baseball player. So I'm not a golfer. Tiger shoots like 68, but I beat him. One hole. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a par three, 230 yards over water. I hit it to like 10 feet, made the putt for birdie, and I said, I can quit now. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> Being able to play golf with him at a young age, and I say a young age. I mean, yeah. he was a good, very good amateur then, yeah. one of the best amateurs in the game at yeah. that time. Did you see the potential in him and what he had coming and what he was going what, what he was about to give to the game of golf? I saw it, you know, I grew up in Oklahoma City. And when he was on the, what was the Ed Sullivan show? Mm-hmm. I saw him then. And there was an article him in Jet Magazine. And so I said, I'm going to watch this guy and see what he turns into. So I knew everything about Tiger. I watched everything, him growing up. I knew everything about him. I mean, I was a huge Tiger fan, still am to this day. And... I knew that he was a special breed. I mean, he was, you got Jack Nicholas, yep. you know, who was one in a million. Then you have Tiger, who's one in a million. And now you got some guy from the University of Texas, Scotty <laughs> Scheffler, who's, who's one in a million. Is that hard for an Oklahoma guy to say? Uh, no, it's not. It's not because I got Scheffler on all my golf pools. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why. But, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, with the Oklahoma-Texas thing. We, we played last year. It was me and Glenn Day. And then we ended up playing with West Shorts. <laughs> and so, you know, we gave him the run around the whole time, you know, that Oklahoma-Texas, Oklahoma-Texas. And then inside they, um, they, they have all the giveaways, the shirts. And so they had a blue shirt, and they had it only in a large, a pullover. And they had a kind of an orange shirt in the double XL. I wear a double XL, and I go, ah, I can't get that. I cannot get that. I said, give me the triple X black sh- pullover, which is way too big. But I said, I'm not getting the orange. I don't blame you. <laughs> I don't blame you one bit. <laughs> so it's, you know, that's the great thing about college, the rivalries. 
And it's like, you know, when they, when they played USC in the, in the championship game, I mean, I was a Big 12 guy, mm -hmm. our Big 8 guy, and I said, no, I'm pulling for Texas. And that was some type of game. How tough was that for you to do? No, though? it was not tough at all. Okay. No, because I'm, I'm loyal to the conference okay. as, as compared to, but, you know, if it's Oklahoma, Texas, oh, there's no way. I'm boomer sooner all the way, baby. Them going to the SEC, do you think that's going to be a harsh dose of reality? SEC, somebody else's conference. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I see the jokes there. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I tell you what, I don't know the way what college is, is turning into now because with realignment, everything, you have all these free agents now. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the old coaches are going to be getting out of the game because now the players have a lot more pool. And before you had all the, all the, the coaches said, if you don't do this, we're taking away your scholarship. You got to do this. And now, now the players come back. Oh yeah, I can just go in the portal. You right. know, I, you know, and I can, I can make a million dollars in the NIL. It's crazy, but you know, it shows you how much, how far college sports have come and how much money they're really making. So, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be something else, but, but, but college and, and, and football and baseball and basketball, I mean, I'm, I'm all for it. I love it. What's the best part of your golf game? Short game. Uh, the course I belong to is a Fazio course back in uh, Leewood, Kansas, called Hallbrook. 151 slope rating. So if you, if you know Fazio courses, a lot of three-tiered greens, false fronts, Ball coming back off the front, you got to be able to flop it up. You got to be able to chip and run it. You got to be able to hit it up and stop it. And so I spend a lot of time in the short game area because that's where the, most of the strokes are. You hit your driver 14 times a day. That's it. You know, you hit your wedges, you're going to be hitting your wedges, you know, probably 20, 30 times a day. So, and your putter. So you take the club, you're going to hit the most. And that's what I tend to work with a lot. Glenn Day gave me a few lessons today, you know, on my drive because, you know, from playing baseball, I was more of a hands guy. I had mm -hmm. quick hands, and that doesn't always translate in the golf game. But, you know, I've got my index right now, right now to 1.4. Wow. But it's all with the athletic ability and, and the hand-eye coordination because of baseball. But when you're not consistent – you know, that's when, you know, it shows up under pressure or, you know, when you need a good swing. And so he showed me a few things a day and it's like, you know, I can't wait when I get through it here, go out to the range, work on that, that swing that he was telling me about and, you know, be ready to go tomorrow. On you go. <laughs> I mean, I love that. I love that. Favorite golf course or best golf course you've ever played? Well, I've had a chance to play Augusta three times and three times something happened to the member. So, well, the first time we... They, Meaning they, you well, did never get to play. I never got the chance to play Augusta. Oh. So that's going to be on my bucket list. The, the first time I was, with, uh, I was with Toronto, and so they had the, uh, the Super Show in Atlanta, and, and I was getting ready to go down there, and I was, had plans to go play Augusta. The member had a heart attack the, the, like three or four days before. Oh, so, how sad. And the member has, you know, he, he, he didn't pass away, so that was good. But uh, we, we couldn't get on the golf course because the member has to be on the course. The next year, okay, it's all set up again. I'm going to play, and a huge ice storm hit. Oh, no. And so it closed down everything from Atlanta to Augusta. Mm -hmm. you, it just shut down Atlanta, and I'm like, man, it's just not meant to happen. So, and then the third time, uh, my brother was being inducted into the Softball Hall of Fame and uh, one of my good friends, George Hobbs, who's an easy-go rep, lives in Kansas City, grew up in Augusta. And every year we would go down with two or three athletes, and we would play during Masters Week. We would take out all the easy-go clients, and we play 36 holes a day. Guys like Ozzy Smith. You had Mike Schmidt, George Brett, Bo Jackson, uh, uh, Fred McGriff, uh, Marcus Allen. Uh, so we all would come down there at different times, and we spend the whole week, Monday through Saturday, just playing golf and then watching the Masters. And phenomenal. But, I, but I've never had a chance. But to get back, the best course I've ever played 
is a course where there's only two members, and that's in Colorado, Sanctuary. Really? Yes. I've heard of it. Sanctuary, only two members, and it's the husband and wife, and it's the owner of Remax. And uh, they wouldn't let him join Castle Pines, and he says, to heck with that, I'm going to build my own course. And when you go there, it's like, take a camera, because you got the Rocky Mountains. He has like 400 herd of elk that roam the property. The ninth hole, the ninth green is, is, is shaped like the Remax balloon, the yeah. gondola. Yeah. And I played with the pro out there. And they don't, like I say, it's only two members, but they have charity golf tournaments all throughout the week. And that's how you get a chance to play it. But if you ever get a chance, if you're ever anywhere and you say, hey, you want to come play Sanctuary? Just drop everything and say yes. I mean, the greens run about a 14. You know, you're hitting over cliffs, over, you know, into the backdrop of the Rocky Mountains. It is fabulous. So that is one of the nicest courses I've ever played. Last question. Fantasy foursome, living or deceased, you and three others that you would like to play around at golf with, who would they be? Tiger, Lee Trevino. Got to play with Lee because that's going to that's gonna be funny. Let's see, myself. And you know what? I would probably, you know, as much as he'd done for me, I would bring my brother Fred. Oh, how about <laughs> he, that? He, he's, he's my caddy. So, and the fact is, he runs the skins game here, and everybody knows Fred more than they know me. <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, I would, I would bring him because we'd, we'd definitely enjoy it. But Tiger and Lee? Oh, yeah. Just the chatter between the, the those stories. two. And the yes. Stories. It's the stories. They would be and, great. You know, and I got a chance to talk to Tiger quite a bit. I remember when, when he his first started in the Canadian Open, and uh, that was before all the crowds. And right. so I got a chance to sit there and said, Hey, Tiger, I'm, I got you in my pool today. Let's go. I'm pulling for you. You got to win it. He said, Hey, I come to win it. You know, and, and you know, everybody emulates that shot out of the sand. I have a tournament in Toronto, and it's going on 15 years now. And the last four years have been at Glen Abbey. And so we, we duplicate that shot out of the sand, you know, hitting, hitting a six iron. And now sometimes we can even get a seven iron out of there. So wow. I tell Tiger, it wasn't that tough. We did it with the seven iron. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Mr. Carter, thanks so much for the time. I appreciate it. All right. I had a good time, Trey. Thank you very much. Traveling to Fayetteville to watch a game? Forgot to book a room for the night? Beachwood Pinnacle Hotel Group has you covered. Stay where the real fans stay. Staybridge Suites is just south of Baumwalker Stadium and is an all-suite hotel within walking distance of Baumwalker, Bud Walton, Bogle Park, and Razorback Stadium. Or you could stay at the Comfort Inn and Suites with the newly remodeled rooms throughout the entire property. Find them on the web at bphotels.com. When you need an overnight place to stay anywhere in Arkansas, check out bphotels.com first. Beachwood Pinnacle Hotels. At Stevens, our philosophy is to invest every dollar as if it were our own. To seize opportunity. To anticipate rather than react. To deliver constant focus in an ever-changing world. And to pursue the objectives of our clients in order to help them reach their financial goals. A proven history of helping companies and individuals. Stevens, member NYSE SIPC. Welcome back to this edition of From the Short Grass. Congratulations to Stafford Gray. He wins the 49th Maumelle Classic over the weekend. He finished with scores of 70, 68, 67, 11 under par. Had 19 birdies in his three rounds over the three days. He finished nine shots ahead of his nearest competitors. Tyler Reynolds and O.J. Posey tied for second at minus two. Jack Wilson and Kaiser Gudnez finished at minus one. Stafford Gray putting on a green jacket for the third time after winning it in 2017 and 2018. He is your 2024 Maumel Classic champion. And a shout out to Kerry Maddox, the staff at Maumel. The course was in the most fantastic shape I don't think I've ever seen it in. And the weather could not have been better over the three days just fantastic conditions to play golf and unfortunately i didn't play so well that'll do it for this edition of from the short grass i hope you enjoyed my sit down with joe carter and if you missed any episodes you can find us wherever you get your podcast just search from the short grass whenever you find your ball mark on the green fix it and a couple of more and i hope to see you sometime soon from the short grass you've been listening to from the short grass a weekly podcast dedicated to the game of golf This has been a presentation of the Buzz Radio Network.